Suddenly, the gun stopped firing, and there was peace. On a muddy-colored day in September 1945, in a city called Tokyo, an American flag which had been made by machines in Camden, New Jersey, rose slowly into the Japanese air, and there was peace. And this is what it looked like. This is how it was that day when history turned the corner into the future, down a Tokyo street, and the world was at peace, perhaps forever. The Japanese soldier, defeated and disarmed, returned to a homeland stripped of its power and will to make war. Here was testimony to the effectiveness of our super fort incendiary raids. Yokohama, razed and seared by the firebombs. Tokyo, 80% destroyed, 100,000 dead. Antiquated hand pump firefighting apparatus was proof that the Jap had not believed it possible. It was possible, but it would take a long, long time to convince Japan of its defeat. long-range educational program using the press, radio, motion picture, and school facilities was designed to convince the Japs of the Empire's war guilt and to foster peaceful and democratic processes in the defeated country. For these people, men, women, and children, the die was cast. American planes buzzed Tokyo winging over the Imperial Palace, reminding its heaven-born tenant who was boss. Below, Japs bowed with reverence before their unseen emperor, who was now taking orders from Washington, D.C., USA. Emperor Hirohito, 124th of his line, supreme power in Japan, until General MacArthur took over the reins. In these films from another day, General Hideki Tojo rode behind the Mikado in pompous display. At a Yokohama hospital on September 11th, Tojo lay near death after shooting himself with an American pistol. The blood of a Yank sergeant helped save the ex-premier for trial as number one war criminal. Tojo ordered the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. His deed came back to haunt him less than four years later in a blast of atomic energy which roared the final death note for all Japanese militarists. Smoke rose 50,000 feet an explosion equal to 20,000 tons of TNT brought the greatest man-made disaster in the history of the world. This was Hiroshima. The first atomic bombing of August 6th completely leveled four square miles, constituting 60% of the city. Nagasaki, where the strategic air forces loosed a second atomic bomb on August 9th. 18,000 of the city's 50,000 houses and buildings were destroyed, including the vaunted Mitsubishi steel foundry. It was the beginning of the end. The Allied fleet, approximately 400 vessels strong, received its ceasefire orders early on the morning of the 15th. Surrender in the Pacific, cut short new attacks, planned to precede actual invasion of the Japanese mainland. Occupation began on the 30th. Guarded by a cover of aircraft and guns of the 3rd Fleet in Tokyo Bay, U.S. Marines and Blue Jackets walked ashore at the Yokosuka Naval Base, south of Yokohama. Brief formalities marked the official acceptance of the base. Lying half sunk a few yards from shore, the once mighty 33,000-ton battleship Nagato was taken over by a prize crew. Submarine pens. One of Japan's main naval bases, Yokosuka had a formidable lineup of amphibian tanks ready for launching. The Jap garrison eagerly showed off its array of weapons. A Paka suicide plane. Meanwhile, 18 miles to the north, Transports from Okinawa swarmed in over at Sugi Airfield to prepare for the arrival of the Supreme Allied Commander. Wreckage of Japanese aircraft littered the battered field, setting for one of history's most dramatic moments. Japanese labor completed clearing the strip. Atsugi was American manned and ready. And all awaited the C-54 bearing General of the Army Douglas MacArthur at 1400, 30th August, 
the gleaming four-engine transport brought in the Americans slated to assume control over Japan's affairs. Bataan was remembered. The future had begun. First to greet his chief was Lieutenant General Robert Eichelberger, newly appointed commander of the Tokyo area. MacArthur moved to his next great role aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay on the morning of September 2nd. In a 20-minute ceremony conducted topside in the shadow of the battleship's number two 16-inch gun turret, the fate of Japan was sealed forever. The 11-man Japanese delegation was photographed by cameramen perched at every vantage point to record the momentous event for posterity. The stage was set. General MacArthur walked from a cabin to open the surrender ceremonies. We are gathered here, representatives of the major warring powers, to conclude a solemn agreement whereby peace may be restored. The terms and conditions upon which surrender of the Japanese imperial forces is here to be given and accepted are contained in the instrument of surrender now before you. I now invite the representatives of the Emperor of Japan and the Japanese government and the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters to sign the instrument of surrender at the places indicated. On behalf of Emperor Hirohito, Foreign Minister Mamoru Shigemitsu signed for the Japanese government. Japan accepted unconditional surrender according to the provisions of the Potsdam Declaration. The Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers will now sign on behalf of all the nations at war with Japan. Will General Wainwright and General Percival step forward and accompany me while I sign? General Jonathan Wainwright, liberated hero of Corregidor, and British General Arthur Percival, who was forced to surrender Singapore, stood at attention behind MacArthur as he began to write his name with the first of five pens. Pen number one went to General Wainwright. The second pen was handed to General Percival. The third and fourth were earmarked for the National Archives and West Point. The fifth, Mac kept for himself. These proceedings are closed. An empire lost. Territories formerly under Japanese control were divided into five surrender regions to expedite capitulation of field commands. All enemy forces in China, as well as Formosa and northern Indochina, to yield to Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. Those in Manchuria and northern Korea and Karafuto to the Soviet Commander-in-Chief of the Far East. Those in Burma, Thailand, Southern Indochina, Malaya, the Netherlands, Indies, New Guinea, the Bismarck Archipelago, and the Solomons, to Admiral Mountbatten and the Australian Commander. Admiral Nimitz accepted the surrender of the troops in the Ryukyus, Bonins, and Mandated Islands. And General MacArthur, that of the forces in Japan's home islands, Southern Korea, and the Philippines. One of the first field surrenders was on picturesque Cebu Island, Central Philippines. Men of the 8th Army's famed Americal Division participated in ceremonies incident to the capitulation of 2,655 bedraggled Japanese holdouts. The commander of the Japanese 35th Army handed over his saber. Swords of Jap officers were piled six deep before the show on Cebu was over. 
But the supreme moment was yet to come in the Philippines. Mist hung over the governor's palace at Baguio, summer capital of the Commonwealth, as Generals Wainwright and Percival, fresh from the Missouri signing, arrived to see an arch foe capitulate. None other than General Yamashita, ferocious tiger of Malaya, who had exacted surrender from Percival at Singapore. Yamashita came out of his hideout in northern Luzon's Caraballo Mountains formally and unconditionally to give up the remnants of his once powerful forces throughout the Philippines. The general signed on the line. An estimated 40,000 troops were surrendered by Yamashita. Following the 11-minute ceremony, Yamashita was turned over to the MPs as a prisoner of war. And he had a brand new nickname, Gopher of Luzon, hung on him by an anonymous GI. New Bilibid Prison, south of Manila, was the next address for Yamashita. A nice, quiet cell awaited the fangless tiger. Surrender of bypass Marcus Island, 1,200 miles southeast of Tokyo. Aboard the U.S. destroyer Bagley, the Japanese rear admiral handed over a garrison of 2,500 naval personnel. Wake Island, one of the greater chapters of American heroism, was brought to a close on September 4th with old glory run up to mark our retaking of the island. This was strictly a marine show. It belonged to them. Colonel Walter Baylor, last man to leave Wake, proudly accepted the honor as first to return. Wreckage found around the island included the original Grumman F4F Wildcats, part of a marine squadron of only 12 planes, which helped delay the capture of the Pacific Bastion for 14 days. Singapore, this Gibraltar of the East, Overrun in 42 after a swift Japanese advance through the Malay jungles was restored by seaborne occupation forces. Ships of the British Pacific Fleet off Hong Kong, which had been the first Allied stronghold in the Orient to fall. Surrendered on Christmas Day, 1941, Britain's 32-square-mile colony was the scene of massacres that early showed a shocked world how the Jap meant to rule. In August 1945, the British took over again. Navy combat teams flushed snipers from alleys and streets. Hong Kong had heard the last British shots fired in the war. Nanking. For eight years since the infamous Japanese rape of the city, this day was anticipated. In the auditorium of the Central Military Academy, former enemy headquarters, the longtime conqueror at last bowed out. By a stroke of a pen, one million hated Jap troops in China surrendered to Chiang Kai-shek. 170 miles away in Shanghai, the yoke was lifted amid great rejoicing. The fabulous city of nearly four million residents was free for the first time since August 13, 1937. Free with them were approximately 6,000 allied citizens, including about 1,500 Americans. Southern Korea. Yank troops received a roaring welcome from a people who had been under the Japanese lash for nearly 40 years. Surrender ceremonies were held in the throne room of the governor's palace at the capital city of Seoul. The capitulation of all enemy forces in the American occupation zone was taken by Lieutenant General John Hodge, 24th Corps commander.
Outside the palace, the Japanese colors were hauled down. The hermit kingdom was free again. Restored to Koreans were the basic freedoms long denied them by the Japs. Throughout the Pacific area and Asia, these were the hours of reckoning and of rescue. Rescue not alone for oppressed populaces, but also for allied prisoners of war who had endured endless Jap atrocities in hundreds of PW camps. Men from Bataan and Wake, the Aleutians, Marianas, Hong Kong. Men of ships sunk at sea and planes shot down in combat, at long last awakened from a nightmare to learn to laugh once more. The evidence piled up high as camp after camp gave up its surviving prisoners. Well-authenticated stories told of solitary confinement and tortures. The most brutal methods were reserved for those from whom the Japs hoped to force military information. Victims bitterly related incidents of beatings with bats, rifle butts, bamboo rods and belts. The primitive savagery, the filth and starvation were reminiscent of the death camps at Buchenwald and Felsen. Red Cross packages were nearly all stolen by the guards. Death claimed many of the 200,000 Allied prisoners. But for those who lived to see the day of liberation, there was some revenge. Out of the darkness, back to civilization, came men who had shaken hands with death. For thousands of homes the world over, there was to be cheering news. Owing to the Jap trick of not reporting numerous Allied prisoners, men long believed dead could flash the happy word of their survival. The rescued were moved from the Japanese shore to waiting hospital ships. Their freedom was complete. Their hope for freedom forever for all mankind was voiced by their commander aboard the Missouri when he said, it is my earnest hope, and indeed the hope of all mankind, that from this solemn occasion, a better world shall emerge out of the blood and carnage of the past. A world founded upon faith and understanding. A world dedicated to the dignity of man and the fulfillment of his most cherished wish, for freedom, tolerance, and justice.